time is it, Willie? It is 5.12 in the morning. We're about 20 minutes down the road on the way to Delta Waterfowl Expo, second annual in Little Rock, Arkansas. We're going over why we feel nervous. I'll flip this camera around here real quick. Um, let's see. What's all our problems that we had happen all at once? Well, I think the biggest thing to highlight is yet again, we lost power the night before the show. Yep, no power. Last night we got freaking 70 mile an hour winds coming through, straight line winds. Um, neither of us had power. We didn't know anybody with power. So no showers, no bathroom, no nothing. So we're kind of just working on it with no sleep. Really only slept like about three hours last night. Um, it's been it's hot and muggy up here because it rained all night. Very sticky in this car. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we didn't have product show up, so we're coming not short-handed, but not the way we want to come. Uh, hopefully it gets around and we can ship it back down to us in Arkansas, but we'll see how that goes. It's always kind of a shit show. Always is. Um, but we're in Michigan right now. We're not very far from home. We just left at 4.50, so... Once we get out and about and down into uh, a couple other states, we'll probably come back and talk a little bit more about what's going on, especially when it's light. But right now, a little nervous, a little sticky, not super happy. <laughs> but once we get about midway down there, we'll probably pick it up a little bit. We got a 12 hour drive, so ah, it's long, not a lot to do, but just talk to goon over here that's about it that's me man <laughs> <laughs> all right so we're trying to be better about the camera we looked over our other videos and we were like mm, that's that's not what we need to be doing just talking and the same thing every single time so we're trying to be better about the camera trying to be more personable hopefully people actually watch it and see a difference that would be great um but other than that that's about it for this one right that's about it cool all right i'm gonna come back and i'm gonna be better next time i swear <laughs> First stop, Hunter made it about an hour in before having to poop. Great times. Currently backed up in Indiana. Very stupid. Supposedly an accident somewhere, but I don't see it. Well, he's driving. He's almost killed us a couple times. No. But yes. That's he, just my normal driving. He kills us when there's nobody on the road, let alone when it's backed up. Well, I wouldn't want to hurt somebody else. Whatever. But we're nine hours away. Traffic's stupid. You know, pessimistic stuff. That's what we do. Um, that's about it. That's our update. Indiana. Nothing really to talk about. Will there be anything to talk about as we go through states? Not really. Probably not. Say, so what do we got? We got Missouri, Arkansas. Missouri and Arkansas? No. We might tell y'all what we had for lunch. Yeah, lunch. Cool. Looking forward to that. I'm glad we're going to have lunch. Didn't think we'd have the money to have lunch. Cops doing pretty well right now. You think so? Okay, cool. Money guy says yes, so production manager says cool. <laughs> and we're out. This way. Don't worry. I've got all cameras on deck. Oh my god. That's possible. You what did such you a great job. Flip? How did it flip? I have no You're idea, dude. That way. I have no idea. Alright, we finally arrived. We got our passes. We got a bit lost. Uh, they don't give you a map or anything and we're not the smartest fellas, so we got lost. We went upstairs. We couldn't get downstairs. It took us a little while, but we're figuring it out. Now we got to turn down the street. Hope it turns to another street so we can pull up into the convention center and we'll unload. Obviously, I'll show that as we pull in, but it is 111 degrees here. It is hot. Hot as balls. <laughs> it's really hot. Um, like, Holmes, I don't know. Home wasn't super hot. It was 80. Like, it was hot for Michigan summer, but very hot but we're figuring it out oh maybe we're not that's a bridge we're not figuring it out um, 
we'll get it figured out. <laughs> I'll come back to you when we do. All right, we figured it out. Good. It's 10 UEs, but I think we're here. Should be able to shoot up in here, Boom. straight through here. And that trailer right there, there's a the line. Woo! We did it, baby. What's up guys and welcome to Delta Waterfowl Expo. Hunter is here with me today being Hunter. We're here set up. 25,000 people coming in today to look at nothing but duck stuff. So we're here. We're ready. We're warming up. Um, we're right next to some great booths. We got Remington. We got Fast Steel. Everything's looking good so far. Our display set up. Hunter's only broke a few things so we're doing all right. They can't even see you. You no, just walked can. off no. camera. Yeah, I'm off camera because Ridiculous. you're the camera guy, not me. I'm I'm getting warmed up to try to sell the customers. He ain't gonna sell anything. No, no one wants our shit. So we're here. We're gonna give you guys a look around at some of the booths, and uh, we're starting in about an hour and twenty minutes. The doors open. <laughs>
governor is still probably one of my favorite stories from his entire tenure. So he had gone out, it was you know, the typical freezing cold morning, the sun was coming up, ducks started coming in, and everybody fires their gun that's in their hole. And my brother David, who is an avid duck hunter man, happens to be a really good shot, was with my dad that morning. And as soon as the shots were fired and ducks fall, everybody turns and starts patting my dad on the back. Amazing shot, great job, governor, way to go. My brother turns to him and goes, oh my gosh, at least make him fire his gun first. <laughs> so I'm really excited about all the ducks that I'm going to get this season as uh, Governor Arkansas. More importantly, I'm excited about what I know that we can continue to do to preserve duck hunting and all hunting here in the state of Arkansas. It's something I love and enjoy doing, but what's much bigger than that? It is part of our culture. It's a part of who we are. Frankly, it's a way of life for our state. It's a huge industry. But more than anything, it is a lot of moments of fathers and sons, fathers and daughters, grandfathers and grandkids, friends coming together and experiencing something so special and magical together right here in our state. And nobody, let me be very clear, nobody We are going to make sure that Arkansas is always number one when it comes to duck hunting anywhere in the country. I'm so proud of not just what it means for our state, but what it does to bring people together in a way that it, I think is a big part of who we are. I love that about Arkansas. We're going to continue to make sure we stay number one uh, in this category. That's why I'm so excited I get to be here today. My husband Brian is here with me. Hunter Trumbull. There's camera. How we doing? Mm -hmm. It's okay. Am I being bland for the camera? Yes. No. Hey guys, there's no one here yet. It's day two guys. We haven't sold anything, so it's fun. Hello. Locked on sound here. This is a uh, public display of affection. Please come by a call. Hey, what's up guys? Will from Lockdown Sound here. We're finally here at day two of the Delta Waterfowl Hunters Expo. Uh, we're just getting going here. It is about 9 a.m. People are starting to roll in. We've talked to, what, three people so far? So, that's pretty much our day so far. Um, it's hot out. It's about 102 degrees outside. Luckily, the Convention Center stayed pretty cool. Um, yeah. That's about all I got for you guys. We'll get some good, better footage today. We got some seminars going on. We got to talk to some more people. We got a cool sponsorship to announce at the end of this video as well. So be sure to keep your eye out for that. And we'll get going.
guys want to invest in the fire call, we can switch this to the top for you. Hello, day three of Delta Water Festival in Arkansas. It's been a good show. There's a lot of people. This is the most people we've ever seen at a show. I'm hoping that Game Fair, there's more people, but like this is by far the best. This, uh, this beats Texas by a long shot. When and where is Game Fair? Uh, Ramsey, Minnesota. I don't know the date. The 11th, 12th, 13th, the 18th, 19th, 20th. Yeah, we'll go with that. It's a three, it, three, two weekend event. 11 days for us though. In there's in between days where there's nothing going on, but we hope to see you there. All right, we'll start over here. I'm Chris Aiken. I'm a web footed kennels out of Jonesboro, Arkansas. And uh, I'm basically a gun dog trainer. I've been doing it for 33 years. I train dogs for other people. We keep a large number of dogs. We keep over 100 dogs at a time. And we train for the general public. And we do train a lot of hunt test dogs and upper level dogs as well. We, uh, we run AKC and UKC hunt tests. Uh, we run Super Retriever Series and Crown Championships and all that kind of stuff. But we, uh, we've been training for a long time and we've got the chance to train a lot of, a lot of dogs. So we know a little bit about it. We, uh, I'm here to talk about young dogs in their first season, but without that, I want to go all the way from, from how to pick a puppy all the way to their first hunt and, uh, and that first season, which is all the most important part stuff. I don't care what you build, what you do, the foundation is the, is the basis to everything. It's really no different with a dog. You know, the puppy deal is so easy today. When I first started training dogs, you basically bought a puppy out of paper. And it was just whatever you had there locally and whatever you could pick up, which is not always the best puppies. Today's world with Facebook and the internet and, and uh, you know, Instagram, all this kind of stuff, there's advertisements for dogs and puppies all the time. And it's real easy to find good puppies, but it's also real easy that everything's documented today. The hunt test world has, has exploded. It's bigger than it's ever been. It's a lot of fun, there's a reason for it. It's a lot of fun, people love it. And they're also proving what their dogs can do or can't do through the hunt test game. So it makes it real easy as a puppy buyer to be able to buy really good puppies. You know, you can look on the, the pedigrees, everybody's looking on there, they see a bunch of fancy names that we all made up. And nowadays, you know, these hunt test dogs are labeled on there. You can see Master Hunter, Hunt River Champion, Grand Champions, Qualified All Age, FC, AFC, whatever, all these titles may not mean a lot to you as a duck hunter, but it means a lot to you as a puppy that you're buying. Because you know you're buying a quality animal. You know when you're buying a dog that is very trainable, is very compliant, uh, that's very healthy, you can, you can physically do what we're needing to do. Uh, you know, speaking of that, all these dogs are usually health tested. These people go to a lot of time and trouble, a lot of expense to have these dogs health tested. So when you pick up a pedigree, you make sure that this dog has these, these, these accomplishments to their name. And the, 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 bigger the, the bigger the accomplishment, the better the dog. And of course, the more expensive dog's gonna be too. But the difference in a cheap puppy and an expensive puppy is not really that much money when you're talking about a 10, 12 year investment. So buy the best dog you can buy. I tell everybody, anybody can train a good dog. And that's what you're trying to buy. It takes one heck of a trainer to train a bad dog. It's just a lot of work. It's a lot of work. A lot of energy. You got to be a, you got to be a, a psychic and a therapist and a. I mean, it's just too much work. It's just a less pain in the butt. And another thing, when you got a good dog, it's going to make you want to go training because you're seeing success with the dog and you as a team, and it gives you some reason to keep going out there and doing it. A dog that's a pain, uh, you don't you don't want to train it. And next thing you know, he had not been training in a week or two. And, Next thing you know, he's worse than he was. And it's just, this is not a good scenario. So always buy the best puppy you can buy. I'm a, I'm a lab guy first. I'm a golden retriever guy second. I love goldens. I, I'm almost a tie right now. I'm having such good luck with golden retrievers. Uh, I like black labs, better than I do. Yellows and chocolates, although my own personal dog is a yellow lab. I've hunted for the last 11 years. He's a wonderful dog. Uh, his dog was, his daddy was a yellow dog and I also owned. And his mother was yellow lab and also on. So <clears throat> I, I, I may be contradicting myself a little bit there, but I just like a good dog. You know, I like good dogs. I don't care what color they are. And I don't care if they're red, white, and blue. If they can mark real good and do what I tell them to do, I'm probably gonna be in love with them pretty quick. And the better they are, the prettier they get, I promise you. And uh, I got a little black female named Hottie. 
she's got she's grand champion master hunter hall of fame she's not all that good looking a dog but she's beautiful to me she's picked up about fifteen thousand ducks in her life got all the titles and done everything so she's she's beautiful in my eyes if you know what i mean so uh but anyway but there's a it's all personal preference on what you want but we do have the most love of black lads we probably have if i was guessing in the kennel right now that we got 105 dogs i know we got 15 goldens i counted that up friday or thursday but I would say we probably have 10 yellows and the rest of them are all black with exception of two chocolates. So that's kind of what our breakdown is at the kennel. And so it's pretty amazing how many blacks that we do have there. So anyway, once you get past picking out a breeding that you want, you got a mom and a dad you think you want one out of, and everybody says, how do I pick the puppy once I get there? Man, once you get there, every one of those puppies has the exact same genetics. They have the same mom and dad. If you're getting a male, Man, separate out all the females, watch the males for about three seconds. Whichever one hits your feet first, whichever one grabs your eye first, you grab that sucker and you go to the house. And everybody's like, oh no, man, I spent an hour picking out my dog. Well, let me tell you, I got story after story after story where we kept the last puppy out of the litter and trained it just to prove that it would be the best dog in the litter. It's not which one of you grab out of that litter, it's what you do with it once you leave that day. If you take that dog home, you get the best one out of the litter you think. You think, man, this one would like to retrieve better. This is the first one in the water. This is the middle of the water, whatever. And you take that dog home, stick him in the backyard, and do very little with him. He ain't going to be worth a flip. You take the worst one in that whole bunch, you take him home, and you do like I do. Like, I got a 12-week-old puppy right now. We, every day, we do something with that puppy. Not anything big. Every night, my wife and I get on the ranger and ride the farm, ride at dark every night. Just kind of looking around. We take our puppy with us, he's riding on the range. No big deal to most of us, huge deal to him. Never done it. He just been doing this the last few weeks, right? Big deal to him, we stop, we throw some retrieves in the water. I got my wife out there throwing retrieves for me. I kind of hold him, just let him go get in the water. He's swimming through decoys. It's a big deal. Every day, he just gets bigger and better and better and bigger. We're doing bigger stuff. We weren't throwing for me to this gentleman now. We're throwing as far as she can throw it out there. I mean, 40, 50, 60 yards, got a little guy's about that tall. It's amazing. Every day, hey, it's better and better and better. This dog's been, he's been to our lake house. He's been to my duck camp. He's been to Burger King. He's been to Sonic. He's been to Vet. He's been to, you know, uh, he went to, uh, watched a little girl play softball the other day. Went out there, had him on lead, and he got pet in the arm. Those are big days for a puppy. And it's not a lot of work. It's not like you got a fancy pair of boots on, fancy hat and a whistle on. I mean, you're just living life, right? You're just including your puppy into it. Let's face it, if you're going to have this puppy for the next 12 years, going to be part of your family, it's worth a little bit of investment on the front end to make you a nice puppy. You know, spend the time to do that. So, uh, socialize, socialize, socialize. I tell everybody, and, and, and I, I tell everybody, my saying is to carry that puppy everywhere but the electric chair. <laughs> you know, and I, I really believe that. I mean, man, if you can get away with it, carry that dude at church. I don't care. Just carry that dog with you anywhere and everywhere you go, whether it be the office or to the field or the duck blind or whatever. Uh, but all the dogs that are exposed to that, I mean, man, it, they, they, just, they just make better dogs. I don't really even start really training a dog, like doing formal stuff with them until they're six months old. You know, when a puppy's about four and a half months old, they start losing their puppy teeth. And when they're doing that, they run low-grade fever, they don't feel good, they don't really hold the bumper good because it's hurting their teeth. So you kind of get a funny read on a puppy. You know, oh my God, he's not as good as he was a month ago. Well, he just doesn't want to carry a bumper around while it's hurting his mouth. So we just kind of back off that, let him turn six months old, and we do. We go into this strictly hill sit steak, he'll know. It takes a couple of weeks, we teach some of that. We call our conditioning on heel in here, it takes about a week or so. And then we go into teaching to hold a bumper, not drop it, and we go through what we call force fetch. And then we go into steady and make him stay while we're throwing our trips. All this is just a step by step process. In today's world, there's so much information out there that in the, in the internet and on YouTube and all that stuff, there's none or ever a better time to train dogs than now. There's so much information out there that you can find out everything you need to know. I, you know, I had a series of, of dog training videos called Duck Dog Basics with Chris Aiken, and we saw tens of thousands of those things, and they're all on DVD, and of course, I don't even know how many people have a DVD player anymore, but now everybody goes and buys these subscriptions to these deals, and, and they're, just, they're just a wealth of knowledge out there, and they're really good ones too. I've watched a lot of them. Uh, you know, my buddy Freddie King's got one, and, and, and has, I think 150,000 people follow it. It's, it's amazing uh, how much information he has on videos, his or how to do all this stuff. Now, 
we're gonna go ahead. Now we got this little dog. We got a little dog doing obedience. Game four is fast. Game steady. And you don't. You can do most of this in your garage, in your front or backyard. Doesn't take a whole lot of space and whatever. But you've got to get that dog away from there. That's just a deal of convenience when we're doing it at home. You've got to get that dog in different places. And, and you know, if we're getting a duck dog ready, I love carrying my dog in the, the same, same kind of scenarios that I'm going to have during duck season. If I'm going to hunt out of a boat every day during the summer, and the fall, whatever, I want to get that dog in the boat and get him, taking him around, getting him used to that boat. And everybody's, you know, not every puppy's going to be crazy about a, a freaking mud motor. I mean, you know, I'm not crazy about them. Uh, so you gotta get them used to that. Not every dog's gonna be crazy about you driving a boat and that motor hitting a log. You know, you just gotta get them used to it. You don't wanna do this in a dark opening day with six of your closest buddies, I can tell you. So do some of this stuff however you hunt, whether it be in a Ranger, whether it be in an Argo, whether it be a mud motor. I'm thinking all the problems I've ever seen. You know, Argos, that thing kinda spins kinda odd. A lot of puppies don't like that. Boats obviously don't like them. <coughs> Rangers. I mean, just expose them to whatever the way you think you're going to hunt. I mean, most of us hunt the same kind of style most of the season. Try to get them used to it. If you're going to be hunting in flooded timber like I do every day, I want my dogs used to stands on trees. You know, we got these portable stands. I got one called a boomer stand that Avery makes. We got stuff like this right here, you know, uh, like a rough stand. However you're going to hunt, just use that stuff during the off season. You don't have to do this stuff in the marsh or in the woods or wherever. You can do this in your backyard or whatever. I remember when I first started training dogs, I had three dog stands in my backyard on the only three trees I had. And I'd put three dogs, one on each one of them, and I'd mow the whole backyard. And I'd have a dog on each stand. And if they got down, I had to stop lawn mowing, go over and make him get back up on there. And I'd make it, my yard wasn't that big at that time. And, and I would just make them sit up there. That's dog training. I'm not out there with whistles and with decoys and guns, but I'm dog training. I'm getting that dog ready for duck season, getting him sitting on the stands for long periods of time at one time. So just try to expose that dog as many things. If you hunt out of ground blinds, you know, you can put that thing in your living room while you're watching TV. You can teach that dog killing in there. Every time you get up, man, walk where it kill him, make him get in there. I've, I've seen so many videos of people doing that, but it, it all transfers over to hunting field. So if you hunt out of a pit, that's going to be probably the hardest one to do. I've got pits buried in my yard. I got one at each. I've got two kennels. I got pits buried at each one of them, and that's pretty hard if you guys pit on it to get those dogs coming into that pit. So before season, when y'all are out there brushing your blinds, pumping your pits out, you know, getting ready for season, whatever, man, take your dog out there and work him in out of that pit and have your buddies throw for you out there and, and uh, get those dogs used to, get that dog used to that pit. You know, when, when everybody goes for opening day, opening day is a busy day. We've been training our dog all year long. We got him exposed to the ranger. We got him exposed to the gun. We got him, we had him on some birds. We've done some minor things like this. And, and then we're gonna go out there and you get there that morning and there's six of your closest buddies show up to hunt. Do not carry that young dog on that hunt. I'm telling you right now, this is a 10 year, 12 year commitment for you to make this ride right off the bat. Do not carry that dog out there with six guns the first day. You are guaranteed to make a mess of this whole thing. I tell everybody, you need like a two person hunt. Now I, I hunted a young dog last year. I had a little dog named Cowboy. I didn't get to hunt him the first 10 days of season because I had a crowd every day. And it was breaking my heart because I wanted this old dog in the woods. I wanted him to get out there yet. So the, when I did get to, to go, there was me and two other guys. And that's even a little bit bigger than what I want. I really want him to be in one other person. So I told that, I, I stood right here, tree right here, had him on the dog stand. I had the next guy over about 15 yards away and I had the other guy pretty good ways down the hole. We're all shooting 28 gauges every day, and I said, I said, just scatter out here. And I said, if y'all can, y'all take turns shooting. We group come in, had five ducks in it. They didn't do what I told them. They both shot into them. That's what's going to happen. They both shot into them, but I'm over here praying. I was very conscientious to get away from them two guys, you know. And so he did good. He went out there and got the duck. He was on his way back. He was on the way back. He ran into the other duck that was over a flop. Well, you know what he did. He grabs that one. That's just all part of young dog stuff. You just gotta, I tell everybody, you gotta have two things when you, in your pockets when you go on the first hunt. You gotta have a pocket full of patience in this pocket, and you gotta have a pocket full of humor in this pocket. Because if you don't, you're gonna be mad as hell. I just tell you, you're gonna have some goofy stuff happen, okay? And it will work itself out. It will. It just takes a few hunts to do it, a few hunts to do it, okay? So, anyway, so the next thing, so he got those two ducks, ugly, okay ish. 
not really great, we got them, okay? Well, we, I didn't have to go get them, we put it that way. Well, then the next group come in there, they, we shot a single. He went out there beautifully, got it and came back. Now, this is what I call this light on top of their head, and it's got this dim light, this dim light. And I caught him looking up. Now, there's no way you can simulate that as a trainer at home. Now, even us, we got bird boys everywhere, got all that. There's no way you can simulate this stuff. They just got to hunt and they got to figure it out. So he goes and gets that one real cute, comes right back, no problem. I said, all right, guys, if we get a group in here, y'all just bang them up. So we get a group in there, and they kill five or six ducks out of that one bunch. They were right in their face, and they, they shot them up real good. He went and got the first two or three, plenty cute, and then he went out there, and he tried going to grab one, started going to the other one. I had to get on to him a little bit, call him back. These are all things that you're going to have to do when you're hunting. You ha I ha I was my gun was in the case. Okay, I didn't even have a gun out. I was totally dedicated to my dog. I'm sitting over here buying when ducks come in. I'm over here with my sit, sit, sit. He is sitting. He's he got to be thinking, dude, I'm sitting. What are you talking about? But that's my cue to look, to watch. So he, I remind him to sit. He looks up, boom, boom, boom. We kill some ducks. They hit the water. I'm still going, sit, sit. Now I got him on a little leash right here, and I'm kind of halfway hanging on to him. He doesn't break, doesn't move. If he does, I'm rasping him down until he sits down. You know, just making those corrections. But everything I'm doing, I know I'm there that day for that dog. Okay? Now, we ended up killing 12 mallards that day, and man, I was proud of him. He did some messing up. He did some goofing up, but we worked it out, and we got through it. The next day I came back, we came back. I was good with four or five people. We just scattered out a little bit, and, uh, and we shot a limb of the ducks, and he got every one of them. And I looked over at that light, and that light's a little bit more, a little bit more light. Well, by the third hunt, he done picked up 50, 60 ducks. That light's gleaming bright. And every hunt, I watch that dog get better and better and better and better and better. And that's what you do. You just got to keep taking them back. You know, I, I prove this to myself all the time. We got a little sporting goods store in town. I live in called D&W, and, and we always go up there, and sometimes in the afternoons get stuff, whatever. And we're in there, and I run in this guy. And I said, hey, man, how'd old Susie do today? It's like the second day of duck season. Him and his son there, like, how's old Susie doing? Oh, good, good. Good, you can see it in her eye. Good, you know, good. You can see there's some things he's wanting to tell me about her switching ducks, about her eating that till on the way back to the truck, you know, in the back of the ranger, about her peeing in the duck blind, you know, just all the stuff that goes on in a hunt, on the first few hunts. But anyway, or she didn't see that one fall, you know, all those kind of deals. Well, then I'm like, well, good, good, y'all keep it up, y'all keep killing for her, she's gonna be fine. He's like, oh, yeah, she's doing good. She's doing, but you can see in her face that there's something's there, there's something there, there's a story there he can tell. All right, I run this same guy during Christmas. I said, hey man, how's old Susan? Oh man, we killed 36 this morning, she picked up 37. Well, that's pretty good, <laughs> you know, that's a pretty good deal there. You know, she, she, he said, man, he said, she just put it all together. Well, what is it, kept killing. They just kept killing. And they kept figuring it out, and she got better and better and better. Then you run into him two years later, and you're like, hey man, how's Susie? What'd you hear about her? Did you hear she fixed breakfast the other morning before she was blind? She went and parked the ranger for us, you know. I mean, you know, they just get that good. They, they just, they just, they just, they become part of the team, you know. They become part of your buddies. And like my group, if I walked out the door without a dog, they'd be like, "Are we not going hunting today, or what?" They're not. Them, them fat jokers are not going hunting without a dog. You know, they're not going there. They have no, they have no thought process. That they're actually going to get a duck by themselves. And so, my dogs are part of our team. You know, I'm with a bunch of old dudes. I'm older than me. And they're old crotchety dudes, and I mean, they, they, they're not going to go get no duck, I can tell you. And they hunt every day. They love it, but they're not going to go get no duck on their own. So, uh, so anyway, so, so just keep hunting those dogs. You know, keep those dogs. You know, another thing, I think about hunting season. You know, everybody calls me and says, when's it too cold to hunt my dog? Well, my, my theory on this, or my, my opinion on this, is that young dogs don't have an adult coat until they're about 18, 20 months old. They just don't have the same hair that that old dog does. So if you're even thinking, I wonder if it's too cold for my dog, just let your buddy carry his old dog, or you carry your old dog, or whatever. Leave it young dog. If you get a dog that gets a bad attitude towards cold weather, your, your cold water, you're going to have a problem. If that dog gets in there and gets really cold, that could cause you some problems in the future. So just do without. Me personally, I don't hunt a dog if there's ice where I know it's covered. Well, we hunt's pretty deep, so we don't have a whole lot of ice, but we still have a problem with them. Like, we, get, we hunt out to be river style blinds a lot, and we, when it's cold, and we got big ramps, and we got stairs, and those things get slick as all get out. And so I gotta be real careful of that. 
uh, especially with these older dogs that aren't physically as fit as they used to be. But, but just use some common sense on them young dogs. It's not a manly man deal, leave your dog at home. Everybody's like, oh, he's soft about his dog. Dude, I love that dog as much as I love the rest of my family. I'm not, I don't want to hurt anybody in my family. I sure don't want to hurt my dog. It ain't not being less of a, you know, just throw an ego in the trash. And take care of your dogs, because, man, they do everything they can for us. So we can do the most we can for them. Because we get a lot of dogs. I remember about 10 years ago in Arkansas, the ice was about three quarter of an inch thick in the rice field opening day. That ruined as many young dogs as I ever remember one season. That is, it was just horrible. And what it also did, it ruined a bunch of old dogs too, because that night, everybody got to call me. Man, old Bubba's peeing blood. What do I do? Well, what happens is, when those dogs are running through that ice, they're damaging muscle tissue in their, in their front legs and their chest. And when that does, it's increasing stuff goes into their kidneys that looks like blood. I it's a big term for it, I can't what it is. But when they pee, it's going to be that red looking stuff. It looks just like blood. But I just, I, everybody called and told off on herself that they had hunted their dogs in that ice. You know, and some of these dogs are like nine, ten months old. I'm like, you're a moron, you know? I mean, what, and, and the next day it was 50 degrees all day long, you know? There wasn't any problem just waiting until the next day. But people just can't do it. But just, just use some common sense and, and take care of your dog the best you can. You know, there's, there's never been a better time to have a duck dog. And what I mean by that is, is the knowledge of getting a great puppy, you know, being able to, to locate a great puppy. There's no better time than we have right now. The train equipment, e-collars, dog stands, vest, e-collar, everything. Everything just so much better than what it's been. When I first had a, my first collar I bought in 1986 was a Tritronics Pro 500 with a big kind of antenna. Mickey Mouse had one red button on it and you could either train your dog with it or jump start your truck. That thing was that hot, man. It was pathetic. And you had to have a certain kind of dog to train that dog with it. Well, nowadays the collar I'm using is like 300 bucks. Got 24 different levels, got vibrate, got tone on it. I mean, it's, it's, you can customize it to every dog, no matter what the infraction is, right there at your fingertips. It's amazing. And some of them even adjust more than that. So e-collars are definitely there. The range is better, the consistency is better, the, the variable of rate is, is so much better now than what it was then. It's unreal. The dog food, I feed, you can do with 3020 is what I feed. And I tell you, I fed every dog food there is. I fed some of them for long periods of time. And every dog food you can do, I swear I'll never switch again. This dog food has made my life so easy. When I fed other brands and some, some big name brands, I always fought my weights. I always, if, let me tell you, when mom and dad come to see their dog they hadn't seen in two months, if that dog goes out there and, and smacks a triple and runs a big blind, they could care less if their dog's five pounds on their way. They couldn't even see that triple blind. All they could see that dog skinny. With you can move, I don't have any trouble with my weights. So what I see with you can move, uh, skin, the hair coat, muscle tone, weight, and clean teeth. Those are the things that I have learned with you can move with 3020. And so with me feeding so many dogs as I'm feeding right now, it makes my life easier. I don't have to worry about that. Because dog training world, it, I tell people all the time, it's kind of an odd statement, but dog training is a small part of dog training. There's so many tasks and so many things we have to do to take care of these dogs every day that this just takes a lot of pressure off me. And if it takes a lot of pressure off me, it'll sure work for guys at home with one or two dogs. So, so if you ever get to try it, get you some 3020, and, uh, and I think you'll be amazed at the hair coat. I mean, they just look like they're wearing a mink coat. I mean, it's amazing how their hair coat looks. And, uh, and it really, I mean, in the recovery time, that's another thing, the recovery. So when we work our dogs a lot, we may run us a big triple or we may run four marks and two lines. And that dog's, I mean, he's having to really work, whether it be swimming, running, whatever. When he comes back, we tie him a trailer. Well, Ten minutes later, he ran roll. And I've never had that kind of recovery time with any other food so you can do. So I, I really, I, I just, I can't be more happy with it. I'm, I'm proud to be part of it. And, and I'm proud to be able to feed it on a daily basis to all these dogs. And I love when our clients keep it on that and, and feed it. They all give me really good feedback and, and really like it a lot. So does anybody have any questions about anything? Go ahead. Great question. I, I thought about it a second. I wish I had. So let, let me show you something about that. I'm on. So years ago, when I first started training, we would check 10 dogs in and five of them would be gun shy. 
Now, I'm going to say our percentage is less than 1% of gunshot dogs, okay? Now, I think a lot of this is because all these dogs are raised in a house now versus in. You think about, I don't know about your house and my house, I got kids, I got people coming in out, we got car doors slamming, we got house doors slamming, we got TV on all the time, me and my wife, my son, it's a lot of chaos in there, so I think that has something to do with these dogs not being worried about gunfire as much. But the other thing, I think they want to understand how to do this. So I'll stand right here on a dog, let's just say it could be three, four, five, six months old, I don't care, as long as he's retrieving good and we'll bring it back real good, okay? And I'll throw me a retrieve out here, just hand thrown, hey, hop, 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 and I throw it out that direction. Now, I got one of my fellas over here at 100 yards out on a, on a golf cart or a Ranger four-wheeler or whatever, walking, whatever. So he's back here, let's say, at 125 yards. All right, so I throw this retrieve, and when that retrieve gets to the top of the arc, he shoots the gun the other direction. That dog's running dead full run. He's running at that bumper. He's focused. He's got a task he's doing, a job he's doing. He's not even hearing that shot. He gets it, comes back. This guy scoots into 100. We repeat the same thing. Guy scoots into 50. Now, if that dog gives me any resistance, if we're throwing, that dog stops when it shoots, or he comes back to me, or any of that, that guy goes back out to 125, 150, okay? Very few times that ever happen, okay? But then this guy's going to 25, then that guy stands right there. Now look, that literally takes five minutes to introduce your dog to gunfire the correct way, all right? From that point in time, you can shoot the gun right over the dog's head. It took five minutes to do the right way. If you do it the wrong way like we used to do, we used to stand right here, have a guy throw a bird out, we'd shoot a gun. That dude jump underneath the truck, roll over on his back, pee on himself, whatever he used to do, he's done. You can just write that dog off for the rest of his life. I mean, you can't, you couldn't hardly fix that stuff. And so it's, it's way better to do it the way I'm talking about right here. It takes one other person uh, to help you, but it's well worth the wait. So thanks for asking that question, because that is a great, great thing. Anybody else? Hey, yes, ma'am. Yep. Applied state, what's that? What's that mean? Okay, so once I tell a dog to do a task, I don't tell him again. So if I tell this dog to kill him right here, and I walk to you and he comes and meets me back over there, I will grab him by starting out with the leash, the collar, whatever. I bring him back to here without I say no, 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 no. I take him to kennel, set him back down there, and I go back out there. Is that what you're asking? So the deal is, today's world, with especially once we we obviously you know how to do all this. This, this guy here, this is he's incredible. But so the deal is, back in the day, and you're too young to remember this, but in my day. It was here, sit, no, here. It was all this main drill sergeant crap, right? We don't have to do that. That was all. My mom told me when I was young, Chris, go clean your room. Chris, go clean your room. Chris, I'm telling you, you better clean your room. Chris, I'm going to call your dad if you don't go clean your room. I never cleaned my room. She wasn't going to do nothing, right? My dad walked in the house, that leather belt on, said Jim on the back. He said, Chris, go clean your room. Because I knew what's coming next, right? Well, the beautiful thing with bus training with these e collars all the time, people got their dogs color conditioned, that dog can be from here to that skid steer over there smelling where a rabbit was. And I can say, Susie here, in that same voice, Susie here, she doesn't come bump, bump, bump with a one. She doesn't come click two. She doesn't come click four. Boom, pew, here she comes to the house. I didn't get into that. Susie, here, 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 here. I didn't get in that here, here. I didn't get in all that. So I challenge my clients when they come hear us work the dogs for them to hear any command we say. They can't hear it. I challenge them. I said, can you, if you ever hear a command, I want you to tell me. They can't do it. We try to keep our voices so low. We try to back everything up after one command we're done talking about it. Now we're going to make it happen. But we're always going to have the tools on there whether it be a collar, a leash, or whether it be an e-collar, whatever, we're gonna have the tools to make that happen. And it's not always easy. I call myself, I got this little golden puppy right now. He is not worth a flip it coming to me. 
And I caught myself out there saying, here, 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 about four times the other day. I'm like, that's it, big shot. Me and you is gonna get on. So I got him a long line. Got a long line on now when he's out here. Boom, I caught me a fish just like he flips in over in here. He comes to the house, jumps in my lap, pet love on him. You just, you just gotta have the tools to back it up. If you don't have tools to back it up, you'll have to get in that here, 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 here. I felt like a fool out the other day. I could hear me in my background going, what are you doing, you know? Because if somebody else did that, I'd be, I'd be, uh, it wouldn't be good. Anybody else? Look, another thing I hadn't talked about, the pin up retriever clubs right over here, they got a boost set up. You know, the hunt test deal has exploded. I mean, it is humongous now. You know, I run the Grand, I run the National, and when I first started running the Grand, there was less than $100. I think it was 91 in my first Grand. Now there's like 1,200 gonna be in that this, this coming spring. The National, they would have anywhere from 125 to 150, and now I think we had 12 or 11, 1183, something like that at the last National. The, 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 the hunt test game is imploding. It's for a great reason, though. It's a lot of fun. These guys all train their own dogs. They, they go out, they, they got a place right down the road here at Mayflower, there at Mayflower, it's called Pepper's Pond. They all get together, they train together. One great thing about dog training people is they love to tell you how to do it. They love to share their, their craft with you. They love to share their knowledge and they love to show you their dog. So you get to see how it all looks and you get to see where you're going. So this pin up Retriever Club, they, they got a lot of great clients in there of mine. They got a lot of people that know a lot about dogs and uh, they do a lot of training. They got training groups. They love to help you. And uh, so if you get interested in going out there and training with a large group of people, uh, and you, like, you know, these people like to duck hunt, like dove hunt, like train dogs. It's a great group of people. So uh, go there and visit them at the pin booth and uh, they'll get you involved in that. And uh, it's just a lot of fun. It is an addictive sport. First time I ever went to one, I remember my, my, my ex-wife and I were going back years ago. And we drove to Forest City, Arkansas from Jonesboro, which is about 40 miles. And I remember we're driving down the road and I said, this is so stupid driving 45 miles to go run a dog on something. The next weekend I was in Illinois with the same dog. And I was hooked. And I've been from one end of this country to the other with dogs with the whole turtle pool. Uh, they've drugged me all over this country. Uh, a lot of fun. It's a lot of, a lot of fun. We've, we've tied a lot of dogs and, uh, and, and got to meet a lot of great people uh, through that deal. So, uh, so y'all check out Pino. I'm gonna be in the Ukanupa booth. We got Carter over here, we got Brad, Josh, a lot of knowledge in the dog training world. Uh, we're all with, with Ukanupa. If we can ever do anything to help you, uh, just step in there. These guys would love to share everything, anything we can do to help. Thank y'all for coming to the Delta deal. Thank you. such a situational deal it's hard we could sit here for hours and hours and hours and debate and talk about that and never even cover a quarter of the information needed on that so what I've decided to encompass in 
this calling ducks with confidence is confidence in your equipment. So, and what we've talked about as a duck call maker, and there's several other great duck call makers here, is the most important thing is to get a duck call that fits you. So most people buy them. I've talked to a bunch even since this. They buy a duck call and they think the duck call is what it is. It either works or it doesn't. But all these duck calls are adjustable. And they're, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tool and it's adjustable to fit the way you use it. So in places like this are the best places to get these things and where you can get the call adjusted to you. So the duck call, what's up, buddy? The duck call that I really like to use, Monty, I forgot my duck calls now. Well, I've done this every time. The duck call, they're in a backpack right behind me. I'll just have to grab them in a second. So the duck call I like to use, and I'm kind of known for making this called a cut down style duck call. Um, I don't know if any of y'all made one. I would really love to give one away today if anybody is brave enough to come up here and let me tune it to the way you blow it. It's what we've been doing, like asking guys if, they're, if they've been thinking about getting one and kind of on the fence about it. Now, just to show everybody in the crowd that like these are such an adjustable tool. Would she like it? Is she has she been on the fence about blowing the cut down? Yeah. So, but um, and we take money. Yeah, come on up, man. So we're gonna take and I'm gonna show you guys. I'm gonna walk you through the process of what we do. Say you come up to any guy's booth in here. So Mr. Bill Daniels with Rice the guys down here at Rolling Thunder, Buck Gardner, any of these guys can do this. Like if you go up to them, or a lot of guys in stores, if you go up to them and you're blowing a duck call, like I would, I would seriously doubt that this call just out of the bag fits the way that he's gonna blow it, but we can take, we can change reads, we can lengthen them, we can shorten them, we can do all these things to make this duck call fit him better. So again, I want you to try it first and I'm gonna listen and we're gonna go for that. So what we're doing here, this call comes with a 14 mil read in it, a thicker read. Because it was a little bit harder for me to push, we're taking a 10 mil read in it, make it a little thinner read, where it flexes more, get a little more rasp on it.
Yes, sir. Yeah, see where we started. Oh, yeah. And you, I mean, self admittedly, you're no yeah. professional caller, kind of getting into it. And just in that little bit, I feel like we, we made a great improvement there. It just shows that having a call, so calling with confidence, having a call that fits you, and these guys, all of them are pretty well great callers. And we've done this enough, we can kind of point, help, and give tips on how. Heck, I mean, there's some guys that bear callers for me. I'm like, how do you do that? I've been calling for a long time. I'm like, what did you, what did you just do? Yeah. So we can all learn and help. But more than glad to all these guys. More than glad to always help. And it helps to call with confidence, having a piece of equipment that no fits, that no works. All right, this, and it takes a higher end call that you're paying decent money for, and it makes it feel customized to you. Because these ultimately these calls are custom calls. Every one of them is an individual call and we can take it to fit you individually. So, thank you. You, you were a great sport, Monty. <laughs> Woo! Give him a big hand, everybody. Um, so, we've been doing this, and then we open it up to questions. We've had a lot of, we've had questions all over the board. Again, this is kind of a, like I said earlier, it's kind of a tough topic to cover. I like to show people that it helps to call, you, make you more confident when you got a piece of equipment that you know works. So I feel like that makes you more confident and a better caller. But as far as calling ducks, again, we can sit here for hours and talk about it because it's such a story. What's cat giving out? They've got walking around with cat bags. You got a little bulldozer in there? No? Okay. I'm mean, going to be cool if you did. But uh, and that's so situational. We, there's just no way we can cover that. But what we can do is cover specific questions if anybody has them. So if y'all have any questions about anything, we will do our best to walk through them. So if y'all have any questions. So my read material, it's sheet mylar, um, and it comes, I want to say we get it from Germany. But I mean, there's, there's plenty of it here, obviously. You can get sheet mylar, any, I mean, you can get it on heck, eBay, Amazon, it's just sheet mylar, or you can order ready to go reads um, from anybody. I know I sell reads, Echo Duck Calls, RNT, Rolling Thunder, everybody sells read kits that are usually pre-punched or they're usually long because you can't add to a read, right? But you can cut off of it. So they're usually a little long, you can buy them and trim them to fit the call. So the shorter the reed gets, the easier it is to blow, and usually in general, the pitch starts going up. So the longer the reed is, the harder it is to blow, and so you're not getting all that flex. So you got a bigger short reed, easier to blow, it's flexing a lot. A longer reed is not flexing much, it's harder to blow, it gives you a deeper sound. That's how that works. Yeah, no, that's two great questions. Two great questions. I mean, you look like you're just full of questions. Maybe you're not even awake, awake yet. I'll answer any questions you have. How to turn him into a good man? You want me to get my wife up here? She, she would probably ask you because she's not succeeded yet. She's married a duck hunter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wish she would. She, she said, hang on, hang on. <laughs> you know. I don't know if y'all are married yet, just know what you're getting into. It's not an easy life. It's not for the weak of heart. <laughs> See, anybody else got any more questions? Well, y'all are great. This was quick. It's lunchtime and it's Sunday. We've done this a bunch of times this week. I'm telling y'all, y'all might be my favorite crowd yet. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, I do appreciate y'all's time. Thank y'all for stopping by. Enjoy the chairs. She's quiet and everything. I wouldn't move if I was y'all. I have it. I've got three. Mine are 14, 12, and 11. And uh, they're never quiet. You got four? I'm assuming that's one of them. Yeah. Yeah, I got a girl and two boys. If mine were, I would, I would do about anything for mine to just be quiet for a little while now. It's usually bickering back and forth and fight. Teenagers, they're all teenagers. It's awful. <laughs> hey, all right. I would kick mine out right now if I could. If I could find somebody to take them even, I would, I would try that. So, but, yeah, y'all got any more questions? Anybody got anything? Well, I'll hang out right here a minute. If anybody's got anything they didn't want to ask out loud, I'm here. Busy. Do whatever. And I will.
we'll be over there if anybody wants to come by and try to call that we can fit to you. Obviously, you don't have to buy it. A load of them's free, but you can see that we can adjust the call and what a difference it makes. And then if you want to go buy from somebody else, they can do the same thing. Thank y'all so much. Snow goose on one side, and a goose on the other side. All you do is flip it over. Yeah, both sides. Yeah, uh, and that's ours there. So you can bulk up the spread for essentially the same look, but you're not adding to the bulk. Right. That picture there, you got four dozen. You got some ugly floaters. I found that one floating down the river. I didn't even know they were blue on the inside, but he faded out the blue. Got some old glued on heads in there, spring bases. So that's four dozen. You can double the size of your spread for essentially one decoy. It's 127 dozen in the same trailer. That's going to show you the shadow that they put down. They put down a nice actual new shadow on the ground as well. So this is 15 dozen. 15 dozen decoys fit in one six slot decoy bag. And that leaves the center two slots open. So you can put LP tanks, peanut butter and jelly, anything else down in them. They weigh three pounds a dozen. So that's about 45, 50 pounds per bag. That's 60 dozen decoys right there in two six slot bags. So you don't have to take up all the garage space and all the shed that's space. What so that's why I sell it you. <laughs> I knew I was selling her. Five thousand, I don't know. So the, the nice thing is you have those, and it's nice and easy. That's a kitty litter bucket back there. It's got three and a half, four dozen good boys in that bucket. So it's nice, you put a five gallon bucket. I think I already showed you that one, didn't I? That's full body, so that's ours. Right. Now, the sign right here in the front says it all also. We are 100% made in the USA. Family business is my dad, it's me, my wife, my brother. Family yeah. business. Number nine. I had a guy yesterday walk up and asked my wife, says, How many times can you bend that thing before it breaks? And she goes, I don't know. I've never broke one. And the guy was calling her out on it. He goes, Well, don't you even hunt with them? She says, Yeah, I hunt with them, but we seriously have never broke one. So this morning he started bending it. He's up to 900. I'm like, You can stop it anytime. It's not going to break. <laughs> it's I'll low take carbon every steel show. wire. <laughs> low carbon steel wire. It's not going to break. So, you're going to keep bending, it's not going to break. So our verticals, $64.99 a dozen. Nice thing there, you got a thick stake on it. Some of the other guys, the decoy slide down. It's not going to slide down. With these, you get two of these, four of the walkers, and six feeders in the dozen, $64.99. And the reversible ones are $64.99. And we do have a combo pack also that's six cents, so you can have about that. And then you can see here, even if you take them crisscross and everything else, you're still missing that angle up there if you take those and mix them up. Currently tearing down. Willie's waiting in the truck um, to try to let us get into the building. Um, it's kind of a crapshoot getting out of here. Everyone's doing it all at once. You gotta hope you're first in line. Um, but I'll give a little look at what it looks like as we're tearing down. It's just kind of a... Kind of a mess. Everything's everywhere, but... Somehow it all packs back into the truck. I don't really know how, but uh, I'll be back after we pack.